Optical links offer some fundamental benefits by comparison with electrical links. Electrical printed circuit board or cable waveguides, whether they be strip line or coaxial cables, offer limited isolation from each other and therefore crosstalk is a significant impairment. If we want to mitigate impairment, we have to isolate the waveguides from each other and therefore we're going to have to take more real estate on the printed circuit board or we're going to have to make use of thicker and stiffer cables. They also present a relatively high loss per unit distance at frequencies of 10 gigahertz and above because of skin effect and dielectric losses. In order to reduce the loss of these cables, they've got to be thicker, stiffer, and use more expensive materials. Finally, discontinuities in electrical links due to connectors or packaging parasitics create frequency responses that are difficult to equalize. By contrast, Optical fibers are also waveguides, but they offer excellent field confinement in a very narrow cross-section. So therefore they can be packed right next to each other with very low crosstalk. They offer a broadband frequency response, again, in a very narrow cross-section. So they're thin, light, and easy to route. They can have a tighter bend radius than coaxial cables with very high frequency response. Uh, and they offer a much lower channel loss per meter, much, much lower than electrical links. Finally, the channel response is relatively flat across a wide bandwidth, so they require a lot less equalization for the same data rate. The simplest form of optical communication over fiber operates by modulating and detecting the intensity of light to represent logic levels. This is called intensity modulation direct detection, or IMDD. Doing so implies an optical bandwidth proportional to the baud rate. So for example, a 50 gigabaud 4PAM optical waveform might look something like this. You've got low levels of light power corresponding to the low levels of the symbol and higher levels of optical power corresponding to the high symbol levels. And the optical spectrum would have a bandwidth less than a nanometer. Optical fibers can be broadly placed in two categories. Single mode fibers have a core diameter less than 10 micrometers. They would therefore require precise alignment, more advanced and expensive packaging and connectors and so on. They're typically used for optical wavelengths around 1310 nanometers or 1550 nanometers. These are referred to as O-band and C-band respectively. Multimode fiber, on the other hand, has a thicker core diameter, typically 50 micrometers or more. This relaxes the alignment tolerances and allows for cheaper packaging and connector technologies. Optical wavelengths around 1850 nanometers are most common over multimode fiber. Both fiber types are usually manuf manufactured out of glass, but plastic fibers are also possible and can allow for reduced bend radiuses, albeit at the cost of increased attenuation per unit length. Single mode fiber effectively sustains only one mode of light wave propagation due to its narrow diameter. Therefore, all signals propagate with relatively constant group delay and attenuation, and single mode fiber therefore offers a tremendous raw bandwidth especially for long reaches. Multimode fibers, on the other hand, as the name suggests, permit multiple wave propagation modes, each of which may have differing group delay and attenuation. As a result, incident pulses split into multiple received pulses over long reaches of MMF. The resulting dispersion called modal dispersion is the primary signal impairment over such links. So for example, a class OM4 type of MMF has a 3 dB modal bandwidth at 850 nanometers of light of around 4.7 gigahertz kilometers. That means that it has a bandwidth of 47 gigahertz over a reach of 100 meters. All types of fiber exhibit chromatic dispersion. That's because the refractive index of glass is a function of wavelength. Thus, the velocity of light being related to the refractive index of the glass is also a function of wavelength. Different portions of the modulated light spectrum are therefore propagating with different velocities, and this causes dispersion at the receiver called chromatic dispersion. The result is a familiar ISI, leading to an occlusion of the eye pattern as shown here. Chromatic dispersion is quantified for a given fiber in units of picoseconds per nanometer per kilometer. For example, typical order of magnitude values might be 10 picoseconds per nanometer per kilometer of fiber. So given a 0.5 nanometer optical bandwidth for an IMDD signal, that might lead to 10 picoseconds 
of ISI for a two kilometer link over that particular type of single mode fiber. This really presents a bandwidth limitation on the fiber, but it can be equalized with conventional methods of equalization, such as FIR equalizers. Wavelength division multiplexing, or WDM, is a technique that allows multiple links to be carried over the same fiber using different wavelengths of light. The WDM wavelengths were originally positioned on a 100 gigahertz grid that corresponds to about 0.8 nanometers difference in optical wavelength. This is now referred to as dense WDM or DWDM. Some links use an even denser spacing of 50 gigahertz or 25 gigahertz. This all requires very precise control of the wavelengths of light that are used on each carrier, but it allows for dozens of links to be carried all within the same optical fiber. More recently, less expensive coarse WDM, CWDM, relaxes the spacing between optical carriers to 20 nanometers. Several different optical applications have been defined, combining different fiber types and wavelength uh, plans. SR refers to a short reach standard that allows for transmission over up to about 100 meters of multimode fiber. So for example, 400 gig SR8 carries a total of 400 gig over eight parallel multimode fibers in each direction, 16 fibers in total. So that's approximately 50 gigabits per second per fiber. DR optical applications are intended for up to 500 meters of reach over parallel single mode fibers. So for example, 800 gig DR8 carries a total of 800 gig over eight parallel single mode fibers in each direction, 100 gig per fiber. FR4 and LR4 standards use four wavelengths of WDM up to uh, two kilometers or 10 kilometers respectively for FR4 and LR4 over a single strand of single mode fiber in one direction. So for example, 400 gig FR4 links carry 100 gigabits per second per uh, wavelength times four wavelengths for a total of 400 gigabits per second over a single length of uh, single mode fiber over a distance of up to two kilometers. Reaches beyond 10 kilometers generally employ coherent optical modulation, which is beyond our scope for this presentation. Optical transmitter specifications in many cases are similar to those for electrical links, but there are a few unique ones. OMA is the optical modulation amplitude, which defines uh, the distance between the maximum power of transmitted light and the minimum power of transmitted light used for modulation. ER or extinction ratio defines what fraction of the maximum uh, optical power is extinguished when transmitting the low level. So it's usually expressed as a ratio in dB. A high extinction ratio implies a relatively low minimum power being transmitted relative to the average optical power. So as a result, that tend tends to be associated with more efficient use of the optical power and therefore better power efficiency overall. TDEQ is an interesting specification unique to optical links that allows us to quantify how your transmitter compares to an ideal transmitter. It stands for transmitter and dispersion eye closure quaternary since it's specific to four PAM links. The idea is that a transmitter with a 3 dB TDEQ requires a receiver with 3 dB less input referred noise or 3 dB more TX OMA than an ideal transmitter in order to achieve the same symbol error rate. So a smaller TDEQ is better. Zero dB of TDEQ means the best possible ideal four PAM transmitter there is, noise-free, distortion-free. Now, uh, usually there's a reference receiver associated with this test. Typically, it might be a low pass filter followed by some type of FFE. And it's measured with a pre specified test pattern. So, the measurement procedure for TDEQ is to find the OMA of your transmitter and then conceive of an ideal 4 PAM waveform with the same OMA. And then you can realize how much additive white Gaussian noise that 4 PAM waveform could withstand based on the fact that the level spacing between adjacent 4 PAM levels would be one third of the total OMA. Next, you find the total noise power that can be added to the actual TX waveform 
at the inputs of the receiver, in this case an oscilloscope, to achieve the same symbol error rate given the specified reference receiver, typically a low pass filter and an FIR equalizer. And we need to take into account noise that's already introduced by the measurement oscilloscope. So once you know the amount of noise that the ideal receiver with the same OMA could tolerate and how much the actual receiver subject to the non-ideal transmit waveform can tolerate, you take the ratio of those and express it in dB, and that's your TDEQ. For example, a typical requirement for an optical transmitter may be that it should have a TDEQ less than 2.4 dB. We generally distinguish between two types of optical transmitters, directly modulated transmitters and externally modulated transmitters. In direct modulation, the current through a laser is directly modulated by a transmit amplifier. The laser then converts this current modulation into light modulation in proportion to its slope efficiency. As we modulate the current, we get different levels of light. The slope of that relationship is the slope efficiency. If we turn off the diode completely, that introduces nonlinearities and generally reduces the bandwidth of the modulation. So in order to avoid that, we always operate it with some minimum optical output power and some minimum corresponding current. This corresponds to a relatively low extinction ratio for directly modulated transmitters. For example, something like 5 dB might be typical and therefore implies some inefficiency. External modulation operates by biasing a laser at DC so that it's producing output light continuously. Then a transmit driver drives a relatively wide swing signal into an external modulator. Here's some pictures of external modulators. They're typically capable of higher speeds and higher extinction ratios than direct modulation. And they can also be linearly modulated to produce multi-level signals like 4PAM waveforms. The drawbacks are that external modulators often require a very wide voltage swing, over two volts typically, and sometimes even more than five volts, which implies a very high power driver. So although the higher extinction ratio suggests good efficiency, the fact is the transmit driver may consume a lot more power and the overall link may be less power efficient. Also, these external external these extra external components imply added size and cost. On the receive side, a typical optical receiver can make use of many of the same blocks as copper wireline receivers. However, because of the relatively small amplitude of current received and produced by the photo detector, a low noise front end transimpedance amplifier is required to convert the low amplitude signal into a larger voltage waveform that can process by the remainder of the receiver. The interconnect between the photodiode and transimpedance amplifier and discontinuities along the way are critical parts of the link. Therefore, it's worthwhile to co-optimize the design of the interconnect, TIA, and whatever equalization follows. A typical architecture for a transimpedance amplifier employs a shunt feedback topology, and the feedback resistor is generally a significant performance limitation because its thermal noise is directly input referred and therefore superimposes directly on the current coming from the photodiode through all the intervening uh, discontinuities. So it's been shown that a relatively large feedback resistor obviously results in lower input referred noise but also results in lower bandwidth. Fortunately, modern receivers have sufficient equalization to compensate for that lower bandwidth and can provide better performance overall. Here you can see the benefits of operating the transimpedance amplifier at a surprisingly low bandwidth compared to the baud rate, a small fraction of the baud rate in fact, and compensating for the resulting bandwidth limitation with equalizers that follow, either an FFE or a DFE.